encourage you to read the draft, but it, the description is really is really easy. In fact, within the module we have a list of VPN. Um, a VPN is belonging to uh, one customer, but for sure one customer can have multiple uh, VPNs. So we have some reference to uh, the customer name uh, within the VPN service. We have also some uh, naming or IDs that can be used for internal purpose for a service provider. The other important point is the topology of the VPN. So we have today three types of topology, any to any, hub and spoke, and hub and spoke disjoint. So where the hub cannot uh, talk between each other, it can easily be extended as we are using some uh, identity for, for this. Uh, then we, um, in the IP VPN we are selling, I think there was a consensus between the uh, operators. Um, now we are no more selling just an IP VPN. There is a lot of services on it. And um, one of the famous one is selling attachment to some clouds. So private clouds, public clouds. So this is something that we think is necessary to include. Where to include it? Is it the right way to model it or not? This is something that we need to discuss, but at least we have some proposal here. So we can refer a list of clouds that the VPN must access. Uh, we have a sort of cloud identifier, which is purely internal to the service provider to say, okay, uh, this code is associated, for example, to uh, access to Microsoft or to Amazon or to just to internet. And we can define the list of sites that can access or not access to, uh, to this cloud. Uh, there are also, we also provide the ability to provide some uh, network address translation if uh, required. And especially if the customer is providing us the public IP address to, uh, um, to perform the net. Uh, there are also some parameters regarding multicast. Um, multicast is a bit tricky because um, Sometimes we absolutely need to discuss some parameters with the customers. So for example, the type of a tree that need to be used. Um, and if it's uh, ASM, for example, multicast, we need to, to discuss what would be the position of the rendezvous point if the customer want a specific uh, setup. That's why there is some lot of details for, for multicast configuration. Next slide, please. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Kiriti Kompela, from a minimalist point of view, if any to end VPN is everyone is a hub. Just a comment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I already described this, so you can go to next slide. Now, the biggest part, the site description. Um, so within the site, um, we have a sort of identifier also, which is purely internal to the service provider to identify the site uniquely. Um, and then there are a lot of parameters. I will detail some of them um, after. The f one of the first one is uh, the site type, uh, which will represent the role of the site within the topology. So especially for uh, urban spoke. So is this site a spoke or is it a is it a hub? There was some uh, some um, operational parameters that we uh, added based on some discussion uh, on the mailing list. So some people were asking to be able to schedule the start of a provisioning of a site or when we need to uh, stop uh, the activation and also reporting when uh, it has been up and when it has been down. Um, so then we have a lot of parameters, the location of the customer side diversity and so on. I, I will detail it in, in the next slide. So if you can skip to the next. So the site location. So if in a backbone network, so we have different pops. And when the customer is asking for a new site, we need to be able to uh, locate what is the best place to mesh uh, this customer. Uh, so the parameters that uh, we are requiring from the customer are really simple, just uh, the address of the site. So street, city, country, uh, usual addressing parameters. 
And then we are expecting the orchestration to uh, take those parameters, maybe have some interconnection with some OSS to be able to find uh, the best meshing point uh, within the provider network. Next slide, site diversity. Yeah. Just a quick comment from this on Microsoft Market Lucent. I know this is optional, but as you note here, the tricky thing is that you really might need an interaction with the OSS system. It's mandatory. And, and that's a little bit different to basically all other parameters that you have in the draft, which are. I'm sorry, can you say it again? As a dislocation parameter is typically in an OSS system, in my understanding, while all the rest of the draft is typically what the network orchestrator control. So mm -hmm. this is really a little bit tricky. I, I know that you spell it out, but I just yeah. want to be clear. I completely yeah. agree that this, this is, is a is tricky, tricky part. This is tricky. Yeah. But that's doable. And if you want to automate completely, this is mandatory. Yeah, for sure. The second one is site diversity. So oh. in some specific cases, <laughs> Uh, I think one of the most simple example is the urban spoke. If you have two connections, so if your upside is multi on to the network, you don't want to have the two connections to be on the same node. Otherwise, there is a single point of failure. So we need to be able to provide some uh, diversity service um, to the customer. So we are proposing two scenarios. So one of the first one is to be able to provide a pop diversity. So the oversight uh, part of the group uh, must be provisioned on another pop. Or just, we call this P diversity. So it's really focused on BGP based um, layer free VPN, but we may change the naming. Uh, in fact, it's not diversity. Don't mesh uh, the site of a common group uh, on the same node. So this is useful for primary backup scenario, but this is also useful for, um, for example, if you have some bank that have a lot of uh, agents, um, affiliates uh, within a specific region and you have um, many nodes, you don't want to have, for example, 100 of um, connections for um, a single customer on the same node. So you need, we need to split the connections. Next one. So site avail availability. So um, it's a bit linked to the previous one. So if I have uh, a site um, which requires some redundancy, um, I need to be able to create this redundancy scenario. So having two attachments or three attachments or four attachments or, or whatever. So we are proposing um, three options that can also easily, it's easy to augment it. Uh, so the first option is a single, so no redundancy, basic scenario. The other one is primary backup, so it's a multi homing with two attachments. And the other one is load sharing, so I have multiple access and I'm just doing list cost routing. So when defining um, the site, I know the availability option. So is it part of a primary backup or load sharing? And then I have also a kind of role of the site within this uh, availability service. So is it a primary or is it the backup? So we have both informations. Next slide. The site attachment. So we need to be able, yeah, Katie. So um, Kiri Di Compella. Um, for the availability, if you just have primary and backup, you can actually then support load sharing among the primaries, and you know, so you can have m, you know, m for n kind of uh, resilience. You can define multiple primaries. So instead of saying um, uh, load sharing, you can say all the primaries are by default load shared, and all the backups are just backups, and you can have m for n. That's a good option. Uh, so site attachment. So this container will describe um, how, wh what are the parameters to mesh uh, the customer site on the provider network. So there are multiple parameters. So we have a container for uh, the builder. So maybe the physical or whatever attachment. 
So today it's, uh, uh, it's quite empty. We just provide some, some strings to give some external reference or whatever, but we don't really see what, what to put inside. So if someone has some idea, if it's necessary to put some parameters, feel free. But what parameter about local loop? <laughs> There's too many. <laughs> the uh, other container in the attachment is a connection. So connection is, a, uh, I would say, a layer which is above uh, the bureau. So if it's an IP service, because we are layer free VPN, we will describe the IPv4 and IPv6 layer. So for both IPv4 and IPv6, um, we need a parameter to say, okay, how, how the addressing will be done? Is it static? Is it DHCP or, or whatever? So we have the multiple options there. Uh, also, is there a need for a routing protocol? Because this is something that we need to agree with the customer because if the customer is running OSPF and we buy, if we by default configure ISIS, it will not work. Even if ISIS is not a PC protocol. <laughs> so we can decide uh, what type of protocol is, is used, but there is no much parameter to put here. Uh, because it's, as we mentioned, it's not a configuration, uh, device configuration model. We just need to say, okay, I, I want BG, a BGP session. But uh, to build this BGP session, I, I don't need to say I want to establish a neighbor because my orchestration can derive the neighbor address directly from the IPv4 address that has been allocated. So that's why there is no um, a lot of parameters to describe here. For some protocols like um, uh, OSPF, for example, we need more parameters because, for example, we need to agree about the area address to be used, if we need to use some shamming, what metric, we need to put some very much parameters. Uh, next slide. Now, on top of this uh, attachment, we will provide some, I would say, services. So we call these services. Uh, the, the services that we are proposing is, for example, so quality of service, being able to decide. Um, or, Okay, uh, what are the class of service that I want to propose to the customer? And what will be the behavior? So there is, for the quality of service, there is two options. The first option, which is the easy one, is to propose to the customer some well-known defined profile. So silver, gold, platinum, and so on. So we can use just a string, so standard cost profile using a string, to say, okay, I just want this profile, but then the orchestration knows the parameters associated with these profiles. But uh, as a service provider, there are a lot of customers that are requesting a really um, flexible uh, quality of service parameters. So uh, they are really asking some to define their own class of services and their own constraints. So we need to provide this ability to provide, to configure Mm, these flexible profiles. And here it's more complex to, uh, to abstract. And this is something that is quite similar to a, a, a device configuration because we need to, dif to configure the different class and what is the behavior of, of the class. So what is the bandwidth, or guaranteed bandwidth that is necessary? What is the priority of the class uh, compared to, uh, to others? So it, it's a bit more tricky to abstract. Uh, so there are also some parameters regarding the, the IP bandwidth we are committing on. So if it's an asymmetric access, there may be uh, asymmetric bandwidth. So that's why we have input and output bandwidth. Uh, MTU also can be agreed uh, with the customer. Um, there's also some parameter regarding the traffic protection. Um, it, so in addition of the site availability, we can provide one service more uh, to provide 50 milliseconds of protection. Yeah. A quick question on the bandwidth. Is it the just the bandwidth to the from the site to the next 
uh, or is it the demand it, matrix actually? It's no, no. It's um, there's the bandwidth site to the IP VPN, the relation of the site with the IP VPN. Yeah. So for traffic protection, as usual, there is link protection, not protection, or some fancy uh, options, whatever. Um, for some question, okay. <laughs> okay, for, for some specific customers, there are also some requirements of running MPLS um, with the uh, customer side. So this is an option that we are supporting and also um, some multicast parameters. So is it a receiver site, is it a source site, or is it both? Question. So, um, Kiriti Kompala, I had to answer your uh, question on the email. These are the things I think not the last one, but the rest of them, you could put um, in VPN services as a default for all the sites unless it's overridden by the site. So typically, you know, the QoS, I mean, it can change, the bandwidth can change from site to site, but you could say this is the default, uh, and then you can put it per site. The way you have it right now for every site, you have to define it again. No, you will see that we can define some templates. Yes, only if you have a template that the uh, OSS understands. Oh, you oh you have a template. We can define some site template and oh, apply the, tom the template to a, to a particular site and I then see. override some parameters. Okay, I see, okay. And then the last thing is, what do you do if uh, some sites have MPLS and some sites don't? I mean, it's not a carrier of carriers and... Uh, this cannot work. Exactly. <laughs> so um, um, maybe this could be a VPN parameter as well exactly. than a side parameter. Good point. Next slide, please. So one of the most tricky parts, the VPN policy. Um, basically, a site, unfortunately, can be part of multiple VPNs. And moreover, we can go one step beyond and within a site, some lands can belong to one VPN, some others to another VPN or multiple VPNs. So modeling this communication behavior is not really, is not really easy. Next slide. What we are proposing here uh, in the current version, but this, for sure this is something that we need to discuss, is to introduce the notion of native VPN. Because well, I, I don't have a clear number, but a high number of IP VPNs are just any to any or urban spoke. So there is no need to define fancy policies to say, I want to import this VPN or export the same VPN. We can abstract this just by taking into account the topology that we provided in the VPN configuration. That's why we introduced this native VPN. The native VPN is the basic rule that will be applied for the communication of this site. So if it's any to any, it will access to all the other sites uh, within the VPN. So we expect the orchestration to derive um, this behavior to uh, um, the appropriate uh, route target import export policy, but here we are not talking about route targets or, or whatever complex policies. So that's why a site can belong only to a single native VPN. So single native VPN. But this does not mean that it cannot be part of multiple VPNs. We will see this uh, a little bit after. So if a site is belonging to one native VPN, the VPN policy will be derived from the topology of the VPN that we defined uh, in the VPN container. But we need to handle the complex scenario that I described before. Next slide. So why not allowing for multiple native VPNs? If we consider urban spoke, there may be some tricky scenario where a site is a spoke for a VPN and a hub for another VPN. So here comes some complexity. That's why I was not really in favor to put just a list uh, of VPN. We need something that is more flexible in terms of uh, modeling the attachment um, 
uh, to the other VPNs. So next slide. So the proposal that we are doing uh, now, but I'm not completely uh, fine with this proposal. I find that it's uh, a bit complex and maybe too, it's not enough abstracted for me. Um, we need to model the communication rules. So we need to have something that is as flexible as the VPN policy we are currently defining on, on the uh, router of the network. So we have the ability to say for a site, okay, in which VPN I'm, which VPN routes I'm interested in, and where do I, uh, in fact, export my different lines? So I can say this line will discuss with uh, this VPN and this LAN will discuss with another VPN. So it's quite similar to the import export policy that we have on the device. So that's why it's not really fine to me. I would like to find something else to, to model this. So if anyone has an idea, feel free. Next slide, please. We also need some customer specific uh, information. So for example, um, if the customer requests um, a BGP session, uh, a BGP routing with our network, uh, and want to impose some AS number, we need to um, have this information and, uh, and send it to the orchestration. Also, if there is some um, specific uh, LAN that are connected uh, on our network, and sometimes there are LAN behind LANs, so cascaded LANs, so we need to be also aware about this to uh, um, do the appropriate routing. So next slide. So in the slides, you will see that I'm providing uh, an example of site configuration, so we will not uh, review it uh, here because it's uh, a bit long and maybe uh, uh, the font will be uh, too small. So next slide. So you, you will see here you have the uh, uh, XML configuration of a particular site and how, uh, what is the uh, uh, Cisco router configuration that can be derived from this, just as an example. Next slide, site templates. So Curity, as you pointed, the configuration of a site can be really, really complex. And within a VPN, for example, urban spoke, all the spoke sites may have the same configuration. So to limit the overhead, we are proposing to create some site templates. So when you are creating a site, there is a, um, next slide, please. There is a special leaf, which is templates. If you put it to true, you are, it's not really a, it's not a real site. It's just a template. So you can define some parameters, not all. You can define wh what you want and what section you want. So you can define just a cost policy or an entire site or just the availability information or the security parameters. And then within a regular site, you can decide to apply these templates at a specific points. So at top level, at service level, at attachment level, security section. So we have multiple points of attachment for templates. So it's making the, the modeling and configuration easier. Next slide. May I ask yeah, a clarification sorry. question? question? Sure. So that's a Microsoft marketing listen. So that's a compelling thing. I just, one thing I wondered when I read the draft. So why didn't you go for another list? Because you could put the templates or then another list. Uh, it, it's uh, the, so today it's, it's uh, the same list. Yeah, at the moment it's the same list. And, yeah. Uh, and it's one way, but the, the other solution would be to go for a separate list because then you would we have all templates separate and you would have your sites. And we can. Which seems like a design choice, but yeah, I just wonder that's why doable. We just need to create some groupings to be able exactly. to reuse it, but that's doable. Just think about it. So, for sure, the work is not finished yet. There are some things to look at. So, there were some comments from the list. So I did not list an exhaustive um, list of uh, comments, but uh, there was some point about uh, what, why putting the uh, cloud configuration uh, within the, the VPN, maybe creating a top-level container and then 
uh, a leaf reference. Why not? I, I, I'm not against uh, this. There are some wording to be uh, uh, to be changed, especially if we want to uh, generalize this to uh, any kind of uh, layer free VPN. For me, there is a work to do on expressing the VPN policy and creating a more beautiful abstraction. So please give your ideas about this. And so to extend uh, this model So, if we want to uh, extend it to any kind of VPN, there is a uh, proofing to be done to to ensure that everything is uh, is on track. Uh, operational states. Uh, this was a point that was raised uh, um, maybe at the first edition of the draft. Uh, we don't know if there is something more to do. If we think that there is a need for operational states, we can discuss. Um, but for sure, we don't really want to go into too much detail regarding uh, the, the operation of, of the service. Um, some question also about inter -AS. Is it working fine uh, when one of the connection is or the VPN is coming from another uh, network, so partner, for example, and I need to attach some site on my local network? This is something that we need to uh, uh, to look at also um, hybrid VPNs, which is quite uh, hyped in the in these days uh, at service providers. So having uh, some part of the VPN which is MPLS layer free and some part which are built over IPsec. Uh, also, do we need to deal with more value added services like? DDoS, antivirus, DPI. Do we need something generic to model these uh, add-ons on the VPNs, or is it not is it not in the scope? I, I don't know. And if you have anything else to point, please raise. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. That gives us a, a sort of a, um, an operational question. Um, you're, you're tracking some issues here on slide where there's some emails on the list. There have been some comments in this meeting. Yeah. There will be more issues. How shall we, as a as a team, keep on top of that? Would you like to use the um, the tools issue tracker? Would you like a, a, a wiki page? Um, are you a GitHub freak? Um, I don't know today, but I will discuss with my uh, co-authors to see what's the best way to do this. Yeah. Right, great. So we're at the point then where anybody who's got questions or issues or think things are missing or broken um, should be running to the, I'd say to the mic, but running to the place where the mic isn't. Especially if there is something broken. <laughs> uh, Mark Cariti is marching. I'm going to send the blue sheets around again because quite a lot of people came in uh, after they've gone around the first time. You don't need to sign twice. We need a bigger room. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cariti Compara, one other question is how do you get consensus from other providers that this model covers what they need? Uh, so there's a list of providers already co-authors, and you don't have to make every provider in the world a co-author. But how do you get, you know, uh, sort of a, it's okay from them? That's a good point. I, I'm expecting that they will arrive a point on the mailing list and the, during the working group session. Okay. Yeah, I think, um, I hope that's the answer. I know that some uh, additional providers have shown up on the list recently to comment. And that there are some here, and it's the IETF, and that's how we work. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's an exercise that you could um, go through for some subset of your customers, fill out this Yang data module. Mm -hmm and then try to configure the routers. 
if you can do it with only the information in the data model, you win. The conversation's over. The, the we next don't the exercise at our side, and it's working for it our enterprise okay. services. The, the next question is, next week, your marketing guys will dream up a new service. If you have a way to dream up the new service and add it into the model in such a way that it's extensible, mm. then it's a double win. Yeah. So what do you think about the quality of the yang? Should we be worrying? Should we be invoking um, wonderful yang wizards? Um, or are we close to there and just need a final review much later down the line? Mm. Uh, I would say regarding the syntax, I think we are almost good. There is nothing special to raise. Uh, but we, regarding the question from Kiriti about some modularization, I think there are some things that we can um, make be uh, uh, explored as groupings. So it may, if it happen or not, whatever, but this may things um, more reusable, even if it's not used after, but whatever. The exercise is not too complex. So at least for some uh, parameters that are easy, I would say. Security compiler. Question for Benoit. Are we going to do an L2SM <laughs> with a timeline of uh, three weeks or four weeks? Benoit speaking. So I was kind of expecting this question, right? <laughs> uh, the point is that six months or nine months ago, one of the routing ADs, and Adrian was one of them, and myself, we went to the operators and we asked, and only operators, by the way, and we asked them, do you believe in two commodities for a net 3 VPN service, servicing model? And they said, we think we do, but we're not sure yet. So what happened in the background is, uh, a couple of WebEx calls with only those operators, and Adrian and I, we monitor a couple of those, but not the details, and they said in the end, yes, we have commodities. This was a starting point to create this working group. Now, we might be thinking, there is energy, we've got a good draft, next step is an L2 uh, SM, right? The thing which is slightly, uh, which might be more difficult is that L2 SM depends on technology. So we'd, we will have to ask ourselves if there are communities for L2SM as well. You know, we did that in phases. We are the phase where it starts to be good work. It, we might be thinking about L2SM if there is communities. Actually, I was asking one of the operators yesterday this exact question that we asked for L3SM. Is there amongst you guys enough communities for L2SM? Homework to be done. I would like the operators to do this homework, but we're asking a lot of the, from these operators these days, right, in the ITF. So. <laughs> no, no I, I agree with your point. Layer two VPNs are simpler in terms of I would say features, but regarding the, sometimes the, the service you are providing is really dependent to the technology you are choosing. Should you use eVPN or VPLS or BGP based layer two VPNs, you will have a lot of limitation depending on what you are. So the service is defined by the technology. Um, curated compiler. So I agree with you the VPN service part, but if you factor out the QoS, if you factor out the bandwidth, the availability, um, more eVPN than VPLS, because we never did, you know, active-active multi-homing. We thought about it, but for eVPN, supposedly you have active-active yes. multi-homing and, of course, active backup. So I think that's why you're extracting these, waiting for the uh, answer from the providers on L2SM will be ready. And what is beautiful with eVPN is that you can define just a VPN, which is both L2 and L3. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
one more thing I forgot to mention, this is Benoit speaking, is that we've got also services, uh, young model services defined in the Ethernet forum, right? So we'll have to see how it works. Maybe this is like such a place where we should define some services, young models. So I think what I heard is here is that, that Karichi is volunteering to go away and do some analysis. Go away, yes. Uh, well, yes, <laughs> no, he's, no, he's not volunteering. He's, he's required to, to go away um, and um, do some analysis of, of what the commonalities are across L2 and L3 and maybe L1 since that was his fault originally. <laughs> Uh, and also then that has to include looking at the MEF and the work they've already done on Yang models. Um, and fortunately, all that can be done as private uh, homework and does not have to be brought back to this working group. So, um, that's good. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to thank the authors who, who carved out time uh, under a fair amount of pressure, um, both from the chairs and from Benoit, uh, uh, to get to where we are now. And uh, now it's a working group document. It's open to everybody to, um, to actually do work. Yeah. It could be good if some other service providers can have a proofreading of the document. As Benoit wants me to say, if you work for a service provider, could you please put your hand up? <laughs> <laughs> and they're very shy as well, these service providers. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. And that takes us to the, um, the piece of the agenda that was marked, any other business. Uh, we asked for a 60 minute slot. Uh, which was actually turns out to have been really good uh, guesswork. Uh, we got given 90 minutes, so we have time for anybody to come to the mic and say anything else about layer three server models. We have a taker. Uh, Tung Feng, uh, Chinese Telecom. Uh, I have some uh, thoughts about uh, uh, about the, the role of a controller in this uh, the whole architecture. Uh, in our company, we have some um, projects uh, to control the network resources for uh, faster service provisioning in our network. So. Um, my question is, uh, most of this, because uh, as far as we know, many operators have joined some uh, open source project which is focused on controller, such as Open Denied on us. So my question is, uh, what's the relationship between the uh, orchestration here and the open source controller? Do we need to define the interface between the orchestration orchestrator and the controller? Mm, or we need to define a new architecture? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, and it's a, a really good question. Um, my question is whether to define the interface, standardize the interface between orchestration and the open source uh, controller. controller. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you, you could certainly make an argument that that work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done somewhere. Uh, and I think that somewhere is not in this room. In other words, it's not an L3SM. Not a uh, L3SM, right? But it has to be informed by the work we do here because the thing that is being orchestrated is a layer three VPN okay. that has been defined using our service model. Uh, and it's this mapping through to all the other Yang models that are being done elsewhere in the IETF. And I sort of look at Benoit, who's a, maybe avoiding my eyes, to say, um, you do, do, does that fit? That, that I suppose it's a, a northbound interface towards the service orchestrator. Does that fit anywhere in the ops area at the moment? Um, 
QDT compiler. So it's not a bi it's not a unidirectional thing. Uh, you might think of it that way here, um, but Stefan just referred to a small part of this. When you give the GPS coordinates uh, for where the site is, I have to ask the orchestrator what to do. But if you say I want such and such a bandwidth, you might have to um, ask the orchestrator where do you want to place this. Or if you say I want this kind of availability based on the current topology, uh, the, the service orchestrator might want to know from from the network what's going on and place or replace the service. So I think we're stepping into deep waters there. Doing the service model is the first step. Joining the dots between the service model and the config model is, uh, I think, a bigger step than we might think it is. Yeah, I, I, um, my, my, the picture that I draw, which is not this one, has actually two orchestrators. It has a service orchestrator and a network orchestrator. And so now we've got even more interfaces to, to worry about. But, but you're right, starting at the edges, you know, we have lots of stuff for talking to the devices. And now we're starting at the top edge. And, and hopefully somewhere in the middle we'll miss completely. Oh, thank you. Benoit speaking. So just to complement that, I think the, the only common thing that we've got here is a data model in the same language as Yang. And as you said, we've got multiple interfaces because we've got multiple architecture. One controller, two controllers next to each other, uh, orchestrator, etc. So if you would have to start with a single common thing, which is Yang, and then, you know, if you want to play uh, to encode with your own transport or your own encoding of the day, fine. But just having Yang to start with would be a step in the right direction. And no, it's not covered in ops. Okay, anybody else for any other business? More. Uh, my name is David from Huawei. We think uh, the uh, airspace uh, service model uh, is good for the operator to enable service agility and service automation. So uh, we made an uh, uh, early demo uh, to uh, show, would like to validate it. So, um, and we will show the demo in bits and bytes uh, on Thursday night. So if you are interested, Welcome to uh, look at the demo. Thanks very much. Very good. As fast as you can write drafts, they can write code. <laughs> All right. Um, going once. Going twice. Very good. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, See you in Yokohama unless we finish the work before then. Thank you.